You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. And welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. This week I'm speaking to somebody who's a bit of a legend in my mind, Robert Whittaker. He's uh, an author and somebody who's been coming up in, in stuff that I've been talking about a lot lately. So I will give you the full introduction to him momentarily, but this is going to be a good one. So get ready for it. Before I do that, at the end of June, June 22nd to 25th in British Columbia, Canada, where I reside, close to where I reside, I'm hosting a retreat. It's uh, three days. It's a small group of people. And we're going to be covering a lot of the stuff I talk about on the podcast, about changing our lives, about leaning into fear and considering what's possible on the other side. So if you're at a place in your life where you're like, I know I'm capable of more. I just need some support to get there, some direction. Then that is what this is all about. And you know, again, I've talked about this in the past, but I do it because it's what changed me. It's what I, I wish I could have had. And I eventually found something that worked for me, but God, I wish it had been a bit easier. And this is curated specifically for you, specifically for somebody who's ready to make a change, who feels like they're playing a little bit small, who is historically a little bit hard on themselves. Does that resonate? Usually does. Um, then check it out. Website is uh, anxietypodcast.com. Click on the retreat tab and there is full information just waiting there for your perusal. Also, while you're on the website, if you're interested in coaching or me coming to your event to speak or your business to do a workshop with you, there's all sorts of info there for you. So take a look. If you want to connect with me on social media, Tim J. P. Collins on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Um, I can't keep up with them all. So just, yeah, friend me there or whatever and say hi. I love connecting with people online and doing silly things on my stories to keep you all amused. So hopefully you find that interesting. Okay, let's introduce Robert Whittaker. So he's a journalist and the author of five books, three of which tell the history of psychiatry. Um, his first was Mad in America, Bad Science, Bad Medicine, and the Enduring Mistreatment of the Mentally Ill. Um, the one that really got it for me was his second book on the topic, which was Anatomy of an Epidemic, Magic Bullets, Psychiatric Drugs, and the Astonishing Rise of Mental Illness in America. Uh, he won numerous awards for that book. It's an amazing book. It's been cited by loads of other people in this industry that I respect. His latest book is called Psychiatry Under the Influence and, uh, you know, goes on to further elaborate on these different topics. So Robert is just somebody who's done so much research, traveled the world, poured over all sorts of scientific reports and journals and information to provide knowledge, which just can't really be found anywhere else. And he's got a, a website called Mad in America, which we'll link to in the show notes. But without further ado, let me introduce you to Robert and let's get this show on the road. Here we go. Okay. So Robert Whittaker, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. It's very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Excited to have you on. And um, this has been something which has been coming up um, quite a lot recently. I interviewed somebody about a week ago who was talking about tapering off of antidepressants and the struggle they endured with trying to get off of a drug, which, you know, on their account, they should have never been on in the first place. Um, I've kind of then gone on a bit, a bit of a research tangent and read your book, uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic. I'm actually halfway through reading it twice because there's just so much goodness in there. Um, and of course, we'll link to all of your work in the show notes. But for the benefit of um, people listening who who don't know some of the background, um, it would be, I mean, my first question is like, how did you even get into this kind of work? <laughs> well, it was a really a backdoor way. Uh, so I've been covering medicine, writing about medicine for a long time in, in different sort of forums. I was a newspaper reporter assigned to the medicine beat. Then I was director of publications at Harvard Medical School for a while. And then I had my own, uh, I co-started a company that covered the development of new drugs, publishing company. But how I got into this was this. I came upon some studies where, uh, that really showed abuses of psychiatric patients in research settings. 
And this was my first real entry into psychiatry. So I, I co-wrote a series for the Boston Globe on that subject. Hmm. And that would have been it, except my understanding at that time, this was all the way back in 1998, was a very conventional understanding. My understanding was we were making great progress in understanding the pathology of mental disorders, that we had come to understand that they were due to chemical imbalances in the brain, and that we now had drugs that fixed those chemical imbalances, which is all a story of great progress. And then I, while I was doing that series, right towards the end, I came upon two studies that really belied that narrative. One was a study by Harvard researchers published in 1994, and they said schizophrenia outcomes today, long-term schizophrenia outcomes today, are no better than they were in the first third of the 20th century. And that mm. I'm going like, what? I thought we had these new drugs. That was so great. And then the second one was studies done by the World Health Organization, which they had twice compared outcomes in three poor countries, developing countries, India, Nigeria, and Colombia, with outcomes in the U.S. and six other rich countries. And both times they found that outcomes were much better in the poor countries. Mm. And they actually concluded that, and listen to this, that living in a developed country is, quote, a strong predictor that if you're diagnosed with schizophrenia, you won't have a good outcome. So I wondered, began to wonder, well, why would that be, since we're making all this progress? Those both provide the story of progress. And then the real kicker was when I looked into those World Health Organization studies, they looked at medication usage. And they found out in the poor countries, they only used the antipsychotics acutely, but not chronically, meaning they kept them on for a short period of time, not forever, which is our standard of care, and which I thought was the absolutely, you know, well-established thing to do. But you put all that together, and I began... You know, well, is this narrative true? And it was two things. Is the narrative true? And um, it speaks of a national tragedy if being in this country is a strong predictor you won't do well with this diagnosis. So that's really the beginning. I was just curious about what data that seemed to belie what I thought to be true and also told of uh, a tragedy. Right. And so the the modern-day version of um, antipsychotics really came about in the 50s. Is that right? And what was the impetus for those to come about in the first place? Yeah, the first drug that is remembered as the first antipsychotic is a drug called Thorazine. Mm. Uh, The the chemical name is chlorpromazine. And it's remembered as, it's often cited in conventional histories of psychiatry as kicking off this great psychopharmacological revolution. And it's the first drug remembered as an antipsychotic. And you hear in that word that it's a specific antidote to psychosis. So that's the conventional narrative. But now when you go back to the introduction of Thorazine Thorazine into asylum medicine in 1955, you find out that it was introduced, it was really a chemical initially developed for use in in surgery Mm. as a way to numb uh, the surgical patient without uh, causing him to lose consciousness, to numb certain areas of the brain. And that was seen as maybe you'll reduce the the, um, risk of surgical shock. But what they found is that people were also much less emotionally engaged for longer periods of time. So they said, well, this could be good in asylum. And people were quieter. They didn't care. Right. So they said, well, that'll be good in asylums. It'll quiet these patients. And then what you see is initially it was seen as a major tranquilizer, okay, because that's what it did. It basically sedated people heavily. And then when they said that, when they really studied it, they said, wow, this is like it. And they meant this in a complimentary fashion. They said it, it causes like a chemical lobotomy. In other words, it causes a change in being similar to the surgical lobotomy that was pop, uh, popularized in the 40s. But that was seen as a good thing at the time because uh, at that time that change in being was seen as helpful for somebody. I'm not sure how. Uh, <laughs> Keep them but, quiet. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it wasn't until the mid-1960s that they changed the name to an antipsychotic. And really what psychiatry was doing at that time was trying to use a name that positioned its new drug into sort of an antibiotic mold. In other words, that it was a specific antidote to a disease, which was the model that was revolutionizing, of course, infectious medicine when we had uh, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. But with antibiotics, you know you have a bacterial infection and now you have a drug that's killing that bacteria. This was more like wishful thinking. But there wasn't a discovery of, here's the pathology of psychosis, and now we have an antidote to that pathology. That didn't happen. It really was a sedating, tranquilizing drug that was introduced, made people quieter, 
And the next thing you know, a psychiatry is talking about it as a, uh, an antipsychotic, as if it were something specific to psychosis. A miracle drug. Miracle drug, absolutely. Yeah. It's a magic bullet. And I think to some extent, people want that. I mean, I talk a lot on the podcast about the fact that we're, I mean, that, that was 1950. Fast forward to today, and we're in an instant gratification nation. We're in a world where people, if they're broken, they expect to be fixed, right? And so the, the, the predisposition is you go to the doctor and say, hey, I've got something wrong with me. And the doctor's like, of course, take these tablets, chemical imbalance, fix the imbalance, you're okay. But the, the results aren't, don't reflect that. No, but that's the narrative that we believe in in medicine that really did arise from some remarkable medical achievements mid-century. I mean, insulin for diabetes was was a good thing mm. because uh, uh, that's an example of where they've identified what the pathology is behind it, finding a replacement for it. It's not perfect, but it's a specific thing. Then you got to go back. There's the polio vaccine. That was a huge thing in the 1950s. I mean, people were dying from from, you know, not dying. Well, they were getting, you know, they're getting paralyzed from polio. Young children, so imagine that thing is gone. Um, bacterial infections often could be, uh, could even be, uh, you know, kill you. So antibiotics come in, vaccines come in. We get insulin for diabetes. So it seems like, wow, we're really taming medicine. And you get doctors, you get people saying in the nineteen fifties saying like. Wow, our powers are such pretty soon that we're going to eradicate the disease because we'll have drugs for everything. And psychiatry at this time, which had a bad image, that they weren't real doctors, they were more like policemen in the asylums, they wanted their own magic bullet. And next thing you know, that's what they were touting to the population. And we, But my point is, that's where that magic bullet thinking begins in the 1950s. And it's still with us today, and we've applied it to everything, right? Okay. Uh, I've got a divorce, I've lost my job, I haven't been sleeping, I've got a pill that supposedly is going to fix you. Yeah. But that's where it comes from, this belief that in modern medicine you can find a pill that can just correct whatever your ills are. And it was perfect timing for, for the, the, the people that um, perpetrated that myth, if you will, to put it out there, because with the antibiotics and the insulin, they were on a roll. They were like, look, we've now we've cracked the brain as well, right? You know, sure, sure it fits, right? Yeah. It's just that another medical specialty making this incredibly incredible leap forward. So psychiatry wanted to be part of that narrative of great medical progress, and the story they told made them part of that in terms of the narrative. And, yeah. it, and actually, you know what? If the chemical imbalance story were true, that they identified the molecule of miss in depression or the molecule of miss in madness and they could fix it, that would be greater than the vaccine for polio. That would be greater than an antibiotic and certainly greater than insulin for diabetes because given how incredibly complex the human brain is and how emotions arrive and thinking arrives, to think that you have found the molecules of miss and you could fix it and set everything okay, that would make all these other advances pale in comparison. That's mm. how great the chemical balance story seemingly is. It, almost, it would almost feel like it would be dangerous if it worked, right? On the basis that if, if you could fix the alleged chemical imbalance with a tablet or a pill, um, which I believe in my work and in my experience with my own personal anxiety was an alarm bell ringing in my life that I was doing the wrong things, that I was living out of alignment, that I was treating my body and my mind and my rela relationships badly. If I could take a pill to fix that, I would have carried on the path of, you know, that dangerous path that I was on. Yeah, you know, this is really interesting. There is some thinking, of course, that <clears throat> when, when, when you have these emotions that are so difficult, it's almost like an evolutionary signal that maybe you need to make some changes and you have to readjust your life, say, with depression or other signs of emotional distress, even psychosis. So the pill, the best a pill can do is sort of mask it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're anxious and they prescribe you a benzodiazepine, it doesn't take away the sources of your anxiety, right? You're still like maybe living in whatever situation you're living. But it literally is a pill that makes it difficult to mount an emotional reaction to the world. So right. it's not fixing it. It's changing you. It's, it's, it's thwarting part of your human humanness in terms of the ability to respond emotionally to the world. That's what it's doing. So if we think, if you conceive of humans as these incredible beings 
that are geared to respond to our environment. That is what, in fact, I think our brain is geared to respond to. We do it with emotion and reason. Mm. Um, how are you going to get a pill that's going to still allow you to respond in this way with all the different signals and, um, and, and, and at the same time make you so happy? It's just like a ludicrous thought, right? But and going back to your thing is, you know, if we are creatures sort of fashioned by evolution, right? There are probably reasons for us to be anxious at times. Mm-hmm. There may be reasons for, to, even for depression to set in. I don't know, but we clearly were, were made to be very emotional beings. Absolutely. And I, I get on the phone with people all the time and, and they tell me stories of their racing heart rate and sweating and social anxiety and awkwardness in meetings and panic attacks. And I feel, I always talk about this, but I feel like a a modern day Sherlock Holmes because I'm like, all right, let's park the racing heart rate for a minute. Tell me about your life. And then I hear stories of divorce or trauma or, you know, I hate my job or I hate where I live or I'm struggling with this or, you know, self-esteem, confidence, all these things are buried under the surface. Anxiety is the tip of the iceberg. The complexity is life, is being a human. And as you say, to, to deaden that with with other chemicals, which are, you know, replacing an imbalance we didn't have in the first place, it does seem crazy in itself. Yeah, it almost seems like, uh, what's the word for this? A, a Sisyphean task. I mean, that, that's a long word for it. It, it, it's, it seems like you're trying to do something that's not really possible yeah. to fix, fix your life with a pill, that sort of thing. Mm. But when I first I, I published my first book in 2002, and I hadn't done much public speaking or anything like that. And I remember the first time I spoke about the book before a large audience, I was nervous as could be. I mean, and for a long time, I had a lot of nerves before, like, I'd be on a radio interview or whatever it might be. Now, what, of course, happened is I didn't die in those interviews. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I survived them, and gradually I became more comfortable, right? And I'm sure the whole anxiety was, you know, around what you said, look into your life. Well, I was, af- I was afraid I wouldn't do well. And I, it, it seems so small, but nevertheless, you write a book, you're sort of invested in it. This is your future, so you think there's these bigger things at stake, so you get so nervous. But, but... It's, let's say I'd taken Xanax. Probably then would have been just as nervous the next time I was up, uh, coming up to that. And the point is, I think, that exposure and coping with things help build a resilience at the same time. And we need this sense that, you, as you just said, these things are human, but humans also develop resilience over time. They change things. And, 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 and the person who's 28 is not the person who's 22, who's not the person who's 18. And when we start relying on the pill all the time, we're forgetting that human beings grow up, they become resilient, they learn to, you know, make changes that, you know, overcome such struggles. Yeah. Well, that in itself, in and of itself, is the definition of how we build confidence and belief in ourselves is like you get through one speaking engagement or one you know, golf tournament or whatever your thing is where you're, where you're on the precipice of like about to walk away, about to shut it down, but you stay there and you hang out there and you're like, God, this is uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then you've ticked a box and said, I know that I'm not going to die. Tick. Exactly. I'm not right? going to. And then, so that starts ameliorating that fear. And the second time it was, it took me time. Okay. But the worst one was the first. I still remember that. I was pacing, and the first radio interview, I was just nervous. First TV interview, very, very nervous. Next time, a little less, a little less, a little less. And, you know, you know, it all goes okay. Yeah, and now, for those of you who can't see Robert, because uh, it's audio only, he's laying in a swimming pool doing this recording, so he's very <laughs> relaxed. <laughs> but, 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 but for me, I, I can, I've had a panic attack whilst public speaking before, and I did walk away. So to... Because that was, you know, hangover infused, caffeine infused meltdown that I had, I then had to rebuild and come back from that, which was difficult, but I did. And I had to rebuild the resilience, right? Start from square one. So, so just to kind of put it to bed and and kind of state it from your point of view to date, um, the chemical imbalance is, is, remains a myth. It's never been scientifically proven and continues to be the way, right? Yeah, you know, the whole chemical imbalance story is, is, can somewhat be succinctly summed up. What happened was this. 
they came to understand how the drugs acted on the brain. So that antipsychotics blocked dopamine activity, antidepressants up serotonergic activity. Then they hypothesized, well, if antidepressants up serotonergic activity, maybe people have low serotonin. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that way the drug is fixing a correct, uh, chemical imbalance. That's where the hypothesis arises. But you've got to test the hypothesis. Now you've got to see if people with depression before going on the drug, do they have low serotonergic activity? And it goes all the way back to the early 80s. They weren't finding it. Mm. So in 83, you see the NIMH saying, we're just not finding that people have a lesion in the serotonergic system, that there's deficits or anything that's a problem. In 1999, the American Psychiatric Association in its own textbook said, we're just not finding evidence that people with uh, depression have low serotonin. So if you follow the scientific trail as opposed to the marketing trail for the drugs, you find the disappointment, the, the failure to confirm the hypothesis happens right away, beginning in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And then it just happens. They keep looking and they keep looking and they don't find it. And just to finish this, in 2005, Kenneth Kendler, who's the co-editor-in-chief of psychological medicine, was one of the big investigators of chemical balancing, said, said this. We have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations for mental disorders and have not found them. And then you have 2011, this is my favorite sort of saying, putting the chemical imbalance hypothesis to rest or theory to rest. There's a man named Ronald Pice. He's a psychiatrist. He's the former um, uh, editor-in-chief of Psychiatric Times, which is sort of like the trade publication of the American Psychiatric Association. In 2011, he says, the chemical imbalance theory is a kind of, a mer- urban myth, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. So why is he saying we never said it? He doesn't. He wants to say we always knew it wasn't panning out. Right. Okay. But, uh, you know, at the same time he's saying that, you can just go through year after year, the APA putting on the website, these drugs fix chemical imbalances. So that's really uh, one of the big problems is the American Psychiatric Association in concert with the drug industry, uh, basically promoted to us a a false story, Mm. a false Mm. metaphor. And, of course, it's a metaphor that gets you to take drugs, gets you to stay on the drugs. So it's good for uh, building markets. It makes psychiatrists look like they have magic pills. But, frankly, it it fell apart right from the beginning, in the 70s and 80s. That's what's so remarkable, that you still have people believe in it, right? You know people still hear it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I said to you just before we started recording. I said, you've been doing this for years. You've dedicated your life to this narrative, to changing this narrative. And yet here we are in 2017 and most, a lot of people I come across in the world still believe that they're taking pills to satisfy a chemical imbalance. What? I don't understand why it's such a hidden thing. I mean, I, I guess I do understand it's in the interest of big business to keep that going. Well, you know, there's still some, quote, medical websites out there that promote it. Last time I looked, the American Psychiatric Association was still saying that antidepressants fixed uh, low serotonin in the brain. Mm. So it's still being promoted to the public in these sort of very facile, simple-minded, you know, channels. It makes sense. I mean, as it is, it's what you want to hear as a sufferer. It's like, oh, yeah, deficiency, my vitamin C is low, so I'm going to take some more. Now my cold's gone. Like, we're used to that, right? Yeah, it makes it seem like they do have a solution to this, yeah. a massive pill uh, solution, so it fits into that. But listen, it's um, it's dishonest and extreme. It violates the idea that medicine should be involved in informed consent. And here's the real kicker on this. They, didn't find, they did not find that people with depression had low serotonin before they went on antidepressants. But they found that once you go on an antidepressant, it drives your body into a sub-serotonergic state. You end up with the very thing hypothesized to cause depression in the first place. Mm-hmm. And the reason that is, it's pretty well understood. So you get a drug that ups serotonergic activity, right? Well, your brain, being this incredibly neuroplastic organ, says, uh-oh, I got too much serotonergic activity. So what happens is your presynaptic neurons start putting out less serotonin. And then the postsynaptic neurons, the neurons that receive the message, they actually decrease the density of their receptors for serotonin. And what researchers say is the brain is trying to maintain a homeostatic uh, equilibrium. It's normal functioning. But think about this. Literally. They hypothesized that depression was caused by something amiss with your serotonergic system, that it was too low in some ways. 
And what they found eventually is that your brain drives your, sorry, the drug drives the brain into that very state hypothesized to cause depression in the first place. And you might say, well, is that a problem? Well, that's why you get horrible withdrawal effects because your brain has, has adapted to the presence of the drug. Mm-hmm. And there is a worry, however, that if you stay on these medications long enough and even come off, your brain may not renormalize. And now you are stuck with a serotonergic system that is not operating in a normal fashion. And their thought is that could lead to sort of a permanently dysphoric state. So what I'm trying to say here is one of the values in Western medicine, maybe global medicine, is that you're supposed to be honest with the patient, right? Right. You're supposed to be honest with your diagnosis, and then you're supposed to be honest with saying what the medication or treatment may do. Here, that honesty is just completely missing. It's been missing now for decades, which is... I don't know any other any other area of medicine where you're allowed to say to someone you have this problem when you don't have it. How do you deal with the fact that some people, a lot of people, will come forward and say, "Well, my case is special. I need medicine because I have a very unique genetic trait," or blah blah blah. Um, is there a black and white ability to just say like everybody would be better off having never taken medicine? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. It's, 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 there's a really interesting paper by a man named Stephen Hyman, and he, he was the director of the NIMH when he did this paper. And he outlines just what I said. You have a drug that perturbs some neurotransmitter faction, fa- function, your brain adapts to it, it's now in a new state. He mm-hmm. writes this, it is now a state that is both qualitatively and quantitatively different than normal. Now, how do people experience that state? Many people don't experience it well, especially over the long term, and then they have trouble coming off. But there are people, for whatever reason, we don't really know why, that that change, that alteration in how their brain works, leads them to function better and leads them to feel better, and they want to live that way. And that's fine. You know what I mean? It's, and and I do, you have to recognize that there there is some subset of, say, of people with psychotic disorders that do better on the drugs. I'm not sure what percentage it is. I'm also not sure what percentage it is with antidepressants, because in, in long-term studies, it, it's a very small group. <laughs> but nevertheless, we have to, I think we should honor, if some people say that their lives are much better, well, great. Yeah. And it does seem for some people it turns out that. So. Yeah, I think the, the, the concerning thing uh is that at the moment as i always say somebody wakes up with anxiety or depression tomorrow or develops it and the current kind of the current care that we have in place means that the default is we go to the trusted doctor as always uh we ask their opinion and they you know in their 15 minute appointment hand i mean in my case i went to the doctor and said i've just been on this i mean i even gave them the evidence in my story i said i've just traveled transatlantic flight i've been kind of drinking and not eating particularly well and i feel like i can't sleep and i feel nervous all the time what should i do and they said well you've got anxiety you should take these pills and come back in three months (laughs) Um, and so i did i started taking them and then immediately kind of felt they probably hadn't even done any chemical changes to me yet but i started feeling off because i was probably uh reading into it a bit too much but but that's it is that you know, for the few people who do get benefits, the the massive majority, I think the statistic I saw the other day was one in six Americans are on um, yeah, psychiatric one five. drugs. One in five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Listen, here's the thing on this. All the data that, I, that I've seen about how all these drugs affect people in the aggregate long term, it's really a couple of things. You see increased chronicity. In other words, that the symptoms still are there five, ten years later. And you see increased risk of functional impairment. And you see that with your benzodiazepines, your antidepressants, your antipsychotics. Now, you could make an argument. You went back to the black and white that maybe a society doesn't want medications to be freely prescribed when you those had those long-term um, 
you know, outcomes. Why would you want something that on the whole makes patients worse? Mm-hmm. And then you might even say, well, we don't know who benefits and who does not. So maybe it's really problematic to start to start people down this path. And here's the other thing. So first of all, you got started on this in a very sort of like flippant manner, right? You've just fl- flown from somewhere, tra- transatlantic, you're drinking too much, maybe yeah. something else is going on. The minute you do that, you're taking the risk now of becoming a mental patient. You really are, because you're going to go on this medication, and a lot of people, were you on a benzo or an antidepressant, do you remember? Uh, it was an SSRI, yeah. Yes, yeah, so an antidepressant. Okay? Yeah. Well, a lot of people get stuck on antidepressants and they're not able to come on. I think, actually, I think both. I think they gave me uh, Ativan and oh, something sure, else. Benzo and an SSRI. Yeah. Right? Just in case. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of people get started on that and they don't get off. Mm. And next thing you know, you'll be talking to them five years later and they've got all sorts of problems. Yeah. But that's one path. And that was a risk that you were taking. Well, you weren't taking it because you didn't know this. But in essence, that was a risk being presented to you. That In fact, five years later, you'd be a mental patient. And here's the other thing when people say they're doing better. We have to understand. So five years later, they're doing okay, right? Yeah. And you know how they compare themselves? They compare themselves to that moment when they were doing so poorly. They say, well, I'm better than that when I was overcome with anxiety or something. But let's, they have no way to compare themselves to what they would have been if they'd gotten some other form of non-drug treatment. Where would they be today? Right. So it's, it's basically, even in their own mind, it's an unfair, it's, it's a, not unfair. It's a comparison in their own mind that can be uh, sort of, uh, an illusion skewed yeah for sure yeah because they don't know where they might have been today i mean look at you today how when was this how long ago uh it's in 2011 so six years ago okay yeah. you're not like you were in six years ago right no yeah but if you had been on that drug you wouldn't know how you were going to be off the drug if you were still on those drugs today you wouldn't have a comparison of who you could be today no no and um i think that's part of Part of the the challenge is for me when I took that pill, I'd given the responsibility of my well being to the doctor. I'd taken the pill, and I feel like I, I felt like I'd done my job as the patient. Yeah. I'd done my job. I've taken my tablet, but the truth is, doing my job, hence the reason that I have a podcast and work in this anxiety space now, is that doing my job turned out to be that I needed to change my diet, change my lifestyle, change my job, change my relationships, change where I lived, and I don't say that everybody has to make those significant changes, but these were all the contributing factors to my mental state, to the fact I was anxious, was that I was just burying burying myself under all of these stresses. And the straw that broke the camel's back one day was that I pushed it too far. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I think that's such an important message. I mean, yeah. when, when you really look at people who've... Uh, you know, sort of been in really difficult states, and then five years later, they're in a, they're in a different place. They've all made changes. Right. They didn't just keep going down the same path they were on because that path wasn't working for them. So the the only time you really see this sort of recovery is when people make these changes that with lives that weren't nurturing them in some way. You know. I I never would have been a confident person had I taken medication. Yeah, what? How could you be? I wouldn't have need to div- go through any difficult, you know. I wouldn't have need to overcome any adversity in my life. I wouldn't have need to have gone to a random Toastmasters meeting and stood up at the front shaking when people saying you look really nervous, and I'm like, I am. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have need to got through that situation. I would have popped the pill and said, I'm okay. I'll just take a Xanax before every time I present, and you know. Yeah, the problem is then, of course, this, the internal message is that, in fact, uh, you're not quite right. Yeah. So every day you're sort of taking a pill that says, well, I'm not quite right. Yeah. I need this. Yeah. That's a horrible internal message. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I've been reading up on this thing called DSM-3, which you I know you talk quite a lot about in your writing, but that was the kind of mandate that stated that... Um, uh, what did I write here? That um, diseases of the brain was a thing, right? Yeah, DSM three. Uh, Jeffrey Lieberman, who's a former uh, president of the American Psychiatric Association, he recently wrote a book about the history of psychiatry. Um, and it's a horrible book, but <laughs> <laughs> we won't be putting that in the show notes. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, 
He called the DSM-3 the most important book written like in the last 50 years. Not in psychiatry, just in society. I agree. Mm. It's been the most influential book written. It changed us as a society. And what happened here is, and anxiety is a classic example. So in DSM-1 and DSM-2 and then all the way back throughout history, anxiety was understood to be a, a sort of a normal function, a normal thing that human beings experience. We all were anxious at different times because, you know, life is so anxious-provoking. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult business being alive. It's a difficult business growing yeah. up. And, uh, you know, there can be so many situations that just make you afraid or fearful for yourself, etc. Anyway, anxiety was always understood to be sort of a normal emotion. Now, with DSM-1 and DSM-2, with its Freudian impulses, sometimes it was, that became, you know, you were neurotic, okay? And that, fine, it was still within the framework of normalcy, actually, to be neurotic. And, um, and of course, there's some understanding. People can be more anxious than other people, whatever, whatever reason. But in DSM-3, they, here's the moment. They reconceptualize anxiety as a brain disease. They reconceptualize depression that results from, like, life events. When you lose somebody you love, you lose a job, uh, you know, maybe you're, in some, you're poor, some situation that's so difficult. Depression was... was and anxiety, these emotional moods, were, were moved out of the life events category, or this is how life is, into the brain disease category. That was a huge shift in terms of how we thought about ourselves and, of course, how we treat it. Because if it's a life event thing, then you sort of say, well, what can we do to build up resilience, change life, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But if it's a brain disease, well, then give yourself a pill. And... This is the so that's exactly what happened in DSM three. They switched from psychological explanations for so many of life's difficulties and said we're going to categorize them as brain diseases, diseases of the brain. But was there any scientific discovery behind that reconceptualization? There was not, none, zero. They made this big, huge switch, basically uh, for this reason. The initial reason for doing DSM-3, there was a little bit of sense is, are any of our diagnoses valid? Are any of these things really biological? Well, maybe if we categorize them into like 15 different groups, we can do research to see if they're real biological diseases, okay? But what happened is, that was the bit of the research impulse, and there was supposed to be this development of, quote, research criteria. But then the APA started feeling... That, it was, that its profession was under siege. There was a lot of anti-psychiatry stuff, people saying you function more as a, a policeman rather than a real doctor. Um, there was one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I don't know if you remember yeah, that. Yeah. I love that movie. So there was this sort of, um, you know, almost public-wide sense of, like, psychiatry is something to be made fun of. Mm. Something mm. must be done, kind of, like, built into some climax, right? Yeah, and they're also, by the way, they're now in competition for, for with other professionals for talk therapy. Psychologists is booming. Psychology is booming. You have social workers that are providing. You have counselors. And then you have people in the 70s just offering all sorts of alternative therapies. So mm. psychiatry says, we're faced with extinction. You can read this in their archives. What makes us different than everybody else? Okay. What, what do we have in the marketplace that the psychologists don't have? The counselors don't have. And they said this. What profession has such great image in in the public eye? What do we admire? And they said it's the doctor in the white coat. Mm. So if we psychologists start saying that we're treating real brain diseases, we can in essence present ourselves as doctors in white coats. And now psychiatrists, in fact, began actually wearing white coats in 1980. But the other thing is... If these are diseases of the brain, all these emotional things, you can now get drugs approved for those diseases. You can't get a drug for, like, I don't like my life approved. (laughs) You know? But you can get a drug approved for the disease of depression. Or if your kid's, you know, not adapting well to school, you can't get a drug for kid not liking school. But you can get a drug for ADHD. ADHD is born in 1980 as well. So, by in DSM-3... By adopting a disease model, psychiatry gets to present itself as doctors of the brain, number one. 
And two, what can doctors do, MDs do, that psychologists can't do? Right. Prescribe drugs. So this now becomes their, their competitive advantage in the therapeutic marketplace. And they basically seed talk therapies to these others. And they become, quote, psychopharmacologists. Now, once that happens, they have to sort of sell this new disease model to the public. And you can see that they, they, they mount all sorts of public information campaigns, education campaigns. That's when the chemical imbalance story starts to be fits to the American public. And you can see why it tells the story of brain diseases. Mm. So DSM-3 changes our population. It changes how we raise our kids. It changes how we think about ourselves when we're anxious. It changes about how we think about ourselves when we're depressed. It completely changed us as a society became our philosophy of being. It changed the whole narrative. So essentially from a scarcity mindset of like we're going out of business, we've got yeah. to reinvent ourselves and distinguish ourselves from these other people. Yeah, that's what psychiatry did. Yeah. So they reinvented themselves, absolutely. They reinvented some of themselves from the people who had, you know, their couches in the office or, you know, that sort of thing, or mm. basically were superintendents of asylums to these brain doctors. Mm. That's how they presented themselves. So they reinvent their, their, they rebrand their profession, but it, it gives us, all of society, a new philosophy. Uh, kids aren't supposed to screw up. Kids aren't supposed to hate school. Kids are supposed to sit in school for six hours. And then they should come home and do four hours of homework. Mm-hmm. And if your kid's not adapting, well, maybe the kid can't focus because they got a brain disease. So it, it changed how we thought about ourselves, how resilient we thought we were. Uh, you know, I think it used to be people would have these setbacks in life. They'd say, well, they'd say, you know what? It will pass with time. I have to make changes, that sort of thing. They'd, they'd recall the sense of resilience. Now they say, well, I guess I just have to go to the doctor because I can't do anything about it. Think about how disempowering that is. Well, and that's why in third world countries people do better. That's why historically in, you know, indigenous people in tribes would take care of those people in a community as opposed to like ostracizing them first of all to asylums but then also giving them medication like yeah, they would, yeah they would just stay part of the community that is was working together to survive you know and as per your as in a, uh, anatomy you talk about go if we go back a hundred years or at this point maybe 120 years wasn't it the Quaker organization that used to get group therapy together pre drug? <laughs> That's really 200 years ago is right. when I first started. Really. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, historians have said that's, that may have been the most successful care for bad, pay, quote, bad patients we've ever had. Because what they built, the Quakers, with this idea of, quote, moral therapy, was the idea was they would have asylums in the good meaning of the word, like a, a safe space out mm. of the, you know, the difficulties of life where you could go be in nature, eat well, sleep well, uh, and be a part of a community, and that having that environment and that time that you would have a great capacity to regain your sanity. That's what the Quakers thought. And if you go, historians who've gone back and look at the uh, moral therapy asylums that were built in the early 1800s, it came from England, but our first asylums in the U.S. were around 18, I think the first moral therapy asylum was like 1812. Um, People who came in were really quite crazy, okay? You look at the descriptions of them. But more than 50% would be discharged within 12 months, even like 65 70% would be discharged within 12 months. And frankly, most of them wouldn't come back. Yeah. In other words, they would have a time of madness, so to speak. Like a season, almost, as people describe it. A season of madness, that sort of thing. The best long-term outcome study we was, was done from 19... Excuse me. 1843 to 1856, all the people who went to Worcester Asylum, which was a public asylum built on Quaker principles. And of that group, 58% were discharged and never came back 30 years later, okay? Another 7% or something like that were discharged and then did come back briefly, but then ended up, you know, at the end of 30 years, were still outside of the hospital. The remaining 30 3% Three uh, percent. Thirty years later, it either died or ended up back in the asylum. Mm. But thirty years later, a lot of people were dying at this time. You know, I mean, people were dying yeah. before they reached sixty. That sort of thing. 
It kind of makes sense if you think you take somebody who's sane and put them in a hospital with white walls and sterile environment and pills and flat, shiny surfaces, then maybe they'll go a bit mad as well, you know? Oh, I think anybody who had spent much time in a mental hospital today as a patient would, would not come out well. Mm. And I, I read something about the Rosenhan experience or experiment. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, that actually was the very experiment that, that, made, that embarrassed psychiatry and led to DSM-3. So what happened was Rosenham, David Rosenham was a Stanford psychologist, and this was in 1972, I think is when his paper came out. He and his students, I think it was nine students, went around to mental hospitals and presented and said, hey, I'm hearing a word. I'm hearing this voice in my head. They'd say, well, what is, what is the voice saying? And they would say either thud or, I don't know, one other word. That was it. They wouldn't behave, oddly. They wouldn't... Uh, you know, be agitated. They would just say they were hearing a, hearing a voice. Well, they were all admitted into the hospitals, and they were all diagnosed with schizophrenia based on just hearing this one word. Wow. So that's the first thing that was embarrassing. Second thing was, as Rosenhan reported, they were never found out while in the hospital by the staff. Either the psychiatrists or the psych- or the nurses did not say this. These people are imposters. In fact. People, the college students that were part of the study started feeling a little crazy because the psychiatrists and other staff would just sort of ignore them as if they didn't exist. Mm. Now, you know who did know they were imposters? The The other patients. patients. (laughs) So when he published this, it was such an embarrassment that, that they had you know, diagnose these people with, with schizophrenia. It showed that, well, they really didn't know what they were doing with their diagnoses. And literally, a week after that, the American Psychiatric Association convened a meeting saying, like, what are we going to do? And said, we need a new diagnostic manual. So DSM-3 was born days after the humiliation of the, the Rosenhan experiment. Out of that embarrassment. Yeah, sure. <laughs> because it was like front page news in the magazines. And it was, it was, show, <clears throat> it was showing, as, as Rosenhan said, they, they can't distinguish sanity from insanity, mm. which you, you think would be the easiest thing to do. It makes you wonder, like, if, to, if you took people instead of putting them in that mental hospital and put them in a facility with exercise and journaling and meditation and healthy food choices, what the outcome would be. Is, have there ever been kind of comparative studies like that? Well, that's in essence what the Quakers did. Right. I mean, they gave them good food. Old school, yeah. So they actually yeah. fed them four days. They had exercise out on the front lawn. You'll look at these. There'll be photos of them. They had dances. They would bring in people to, uh, like, read from novels. They would have dances at night. I mean, there's even a story, stories out there that during the early days of moral therapy asylums, sometimes their evening entertainment was so good, people came from outside the community to, to listen to whoever was speaking there and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So we actually know it works. And um, there's plenty of evidence that exercise, for example, is very good for depression. Huge. Huge. Uh, uh, sleep, of course, is like a foundation for good health. Diet's certainly important. I mean, so we know all these things work. And, you know, if you look at the place where you're seeing the best outcomes in the Western world today for psychotic patients in northern Finland, that's literally what they're sort of what they're doing. They're basically making sure people have nurturing environments mm. and not using antipsychotics. Yeah, and for me, a huge change for me has been exercise. Um, the food I eat has been really looking into inflammatory foods that I've been eating, like gluten, which also was you know the cause of my asthma. And so changing some of the foods I eat, trying to get some more healthy omega-3 fats instead of the omega-6s, these have been having a big impact on the way I've felt and my consistent energy and equilibrium over time has improved massively. And I go back to your book and Scottish physician William Buchan, is that how you pronounce it? I think so. Um, but I'm just going to read a little quote because he, uh, this was in 18, the early 1800s. Um, and he wrote in Domestic Medicine, which was the name of his book, the patient ought to take as much exercise in the open air as he can bear. A plan of this kind with a strict attention to diet is a much more rational method of cure than confining the patient within doors and playing him with medicines. 
So that was 200 years ago. <laughs> yeah, the wisdom was there 200 years ago. And you know what we do today? We apply people with medicines. Yeah. That's what we do today, especially if you get hospitalized. We have hospitals. They don't even let you outside. Mm. Imagine going to a psych hospital and you just get drugs and you, you know, I don't know what you do all day, but you're often not even allowed outside. It seems like it's, and it seems like somebody like without, um, without even any kind of severe case of, you know, uh, a mental problem could get into that system quite easily by misdiagnosis and then reporting some symptoms. And then you're like, actually, we need to lock you up. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. I think increasingly, if you look at the people who sometimes end up in hospitals, they've had a no, a mo- they've had a momentary sort of like blip in their life. Mm. I know someone who was literally about to give a talk at, at, at an Ivy League school uh, as but like the graduating talk. She was like the top graduate. And she got nervous the night before, which is understandable. Somehow went for, she. I guess she'd seen, a, she'd seen a counselor or something before this. She ended up locked up. They thought she was so anxious she needed to be locked up. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, she can't give the talk. And she's forcibly medicated for like two weeks. And it took her a year to sort of escape that psychiatric system. So can a, can a, quote, normal person get it sucked into that system? Absolutely. It's happening all the time. Yeah. And you can see why people are, uh, there's so much stigma around this and why people aren't forthcoming about, you know, intrusive thoughts and the stuff that goes on in your head when, you know, even, you know, women who've just had children or people who've going through difficult times in their lives. Some of the things I used to think about, like if I'd gone to the doctor and said them out loud, they probably would have locked me up. I'm sure they would. Especially if you had any thoughts about hurting yourself. Right. Or hurting anybody else. Regardless of whether you're really prepared to act on them. I mean, those thoughts thoughts can get you. Yeah. So, uh, so I wanted to ask you that at what point did the DSM three business and that, that recommendation to kind of save the industry, where did that intersect with what we now have as like big business and just cranking out money? Because it seems like that's the steroid, which is keeping the old, you know, myth alive is now, this is just creating so much money. We can't stop. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, it happened right away. Right. What you did DSM-3, pharmaceutical companies, as the architect of DSM-3, someone named Robert Spitzer, and as he later said, the pharmaceuticals were delighted. Well, why? Because they're taking all these normal things and moving them into disease category. The drug companies immediately knew that they had new markets to, to exploit. And so they immediately began, you said a business, they began giving money to the APA to promote this new model. They began giving money to academic psychiatrists to promote this new model and then also to test their drugs for these new conditions. Mm. And then once they tested them to be the thought leaders and do CME courses and write the textbooks. So big business settled in right away. I mean, there was a really telling thing. Up until 1980, pharmaceutical companies weren't allowed to sponsor scientific symposiums at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. That same year, the APA said to pharmaceutical companies, you can start sponsoring scientific symposiums, breakfasts, lunches, and dinners at our annual meeting, and you can then hire a psychiatrist to present whatever you want, and they will be researched, I mean, they'll be uh, rehearsed talks, Mm -hmm. and you pay us $50,000 for the right to, to give these talks. So now, all of a sudden, you go to the APA meeting, you're getting a free meal, and you think you're hearing Joe Blow from Harvard Medical School or the top people in the country. But what you're really hearing is a paid talk written by the pharmaceutical company to sell the disorder and the, and the drug. So this merging of narrative and, and monetary interests, boy, it really takes off right away. And just to give you an example, in 1987, which is the year Prozac comes to market, we as a country spent about $800 million on psychiatric drugs, okay, as for that one year. Mm-hmm. What do you think we spend now? Tenfold. So like eight, 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 $8 billion. Right. Well, we spent about $40 billion, 50-fold. We went from $800 million to about $40 billion. So from a business point of view, that's a story of a great success story. They built markets. 
They got kids on the drugs. They got 25% of women between some age, 25 to 55 on, on, on drugs, antidepressants. So if you look as a business, your business model is to convert an ever larger segment of the population to use your product. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's what they've done. Now, unfortunately, it's the burden of mental illness has gone up dramatically at the same time in our society. But from a business point of view, brilliant. And so during that time, or, or it must have been hard to find somebody who was willing to actually provide independent research or independent feedback on the basis that everybody was getting backhanders, or not even backhanders, fronthanders. Yeah. It, was, it was out it's, there, right? There's even a really famous moment when it's 1998, the New England Journal of Medicine wanted to do a review of the efficacy of antidepressants. So they canvassed experts in depression, and they basically couldn't find anyone who wasn't taking money from the drug companies in the United States. Mm-hmm. It, had been, it was basically the drug companies came in and bought up one academic psychiatric department after another. They literally said, we, we, almost, we just can't find anyone. I guess eventually they found one person somewhere. And then they said when they asked them the disclosure list, people wouldn't, have, wouldn't be getting money from one company. They'd be getting money from like eight companies. Mm-hmm. And you know what they said at this time? Well, that shows I can be uh, impartial because I'm getting money from eight companies. Product agnostic. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if this pill doesn't work, come back and we'll either double your dose or put you on something else. Oh, yeah, exactly. Fix it. So is the problem still getting worse? I don't know. And the way reason I say this is, on the one hand, that conventional narrative that drove this extraordinary rise in the use of medications, the science has, co- has collapsed. It really has. And just to give you an example, when they were doing DSM-5, when they were making that, the American Psychiatric Association convened a meeting uh, on the validity of psychiatric disorders. And these were all well-known APA psychiatrists. And they said... Uh, have we validated any of these diseases as real diseases? And they all said, we haven't. We failed. So we had hoped to find that the, you know, some sort of data that would show this disease is different from that, but they haven't found it. That's one. The chemical imbalance story has fallen apart. Uh, there's no progress being made in understanding the biology of mental disorders, and outcomes are terrible. The, 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 the number of people seen as sort of chronically impaired by mental disorders has left it's just much higher than it was in, you know, 30 years ago. And, and by some measures, uh, such as people on disability, it's about fourfold higher. Mm. So it's all collapsing, okay? And there's so many people who now are been on these meds and are struggling and, or were on the meds for a while, struggled, and, and managed to get on. At the same time, there's no, there's no real good... Uh, alternative to that that has replaced that narrative in mainstream medicine. So if you go to your doctor and you're you're miserable right now, you're still going to get the drug. You're not going to get a reference to an exercise program, or you know you're not going to get a 15 minute chat about and then a, ref, uh, a referral to a nutritionist by and large. So on the one hand, we have all this evidence this model hasn't worked, and then on the other hand, I don't see any decrease in the use of the medication. I don't see any decrease in the prescribing of medications to kids. It just doesn't show up in the data. So I, we're almost on this balance point. Which way are we going to go? Mm. It, feels a bit, it feels a bit in parallel with some, in some respects to the, the food movement as well because the, the standard American diet has been, you know, we, it, you can almost follow a similar story of like, Ansel Keys and the fat versus sugar debate and how the you know big business in the sugar won through and now we eat everything out of boxes. But it seems like that's people are, are beginning to have awareness, even though if you look on the street, it's still fast food and obesity in a huge way. Yeah. But it feels like the cutting edge is is gaining some ground. Yeah, I think the conventional narrative of uh, you know society wide is switched. Yeah. So whether or not people are are, are actually adopting uh, better diets. That's a that's another question. Although plenty of people are, but the narrative I think is pretty much switched. That like you shouldn't be getting up in the morning and feeding your kids uh, sugar pops and stuff like that, and give them some coke at lunch. And um, I, I really think that there is a a, a sort of um, 
a larger narrative that says eating fresh food is important. Try not to eat a lot of processed foods. Having some fish is important. Cutting down on your red meat is important. Uh, having real bread rather than white bread is important. So I think with the food story, it's further along because the narrative is switched. Yeah. And But we don't have everybody quite adopting to that narrative in terms of their personal lives. Yeah. Well, and one of the most recent blog posts you wrote, I think, was based on Norway. Good old Norway. It's always Norway and Denmark or Sweden or one of those countries. But they, they had a, you, I think your blog post was titled A Crack in the Door or something. But it was essentially talking about how in Norway they've now allowed people to choose a drug-free option, right? Yeah. And the amazing thing about this is there's an amazing political story. So this was... For years, the people who have been in mental hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, have been lobbying the government, saying we don't, well, they're lobbying against forced treatment, but they're also lobbying against forced drug treatment. So they've been lobbying for uh, the health ministry to say, you should be providing medication-free treatment for those in the hospitals that don't want to take the drugs. And finally, that's what the health ministry told psychiatry it had to do. It had started to have to set aside beds. Where for people, and I'm including like psychotic people, mm. that don't want to take these drugs, you still have to treat them without drugs. So where I, in this article you're talking about, this blog you're talking about, I went up to, say, Tromsø, Norway, which is in the north of Norway, where they have a whole ward now set aside for people who do not want medications. So that's a beautiful story about, I mean, there's a long way to go there. Psychiatry in Norway is still not happy. Yeah. But it's a story about grassroots politics and grassroots democracy in essence, where this group of people are so often they're not listened to I'm talking about people categorized as mad or mental patients uh, they got a political voice the health ministry responded and now we'll see where it goes and I'll tell you when I visited the ward it was a very different place mm. yeah, you're talking about exercise, they walk every day you, you, you know there's Trump's was a beautiful place once the sun starts to shine. It's also, there's no locked wards. You want to go shopping? Go shopping. Actually, if you want to leave the place and just check yourself out, you're allowed to do that too. Right. So, right. And you go there on that ward, there's a kitchen there, they're cooking real good food, breakfast, lunch, dinner, everybody eats together, the staff eats with the, you know, the Community. patients. Yeah. 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 People want to be heard, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you, that story seems to have gotten a lot of attention to a lot of readers, which tells you people are hungry, you know, they're hungry for a difference. Yeah. Yeah, I looked at that. Even I was looking for the articles with the most views on your website to see what was most kind of popular culture, and that one was, you know, the highest by a long margin. Yeah, and that just tells you that people are interested in sort of uh, system wide changes and rethinking psychiatry changes. That's sort of thing. Yeah. So where does your where do you see your work taking you moving forward? What's the what's the way to get the message out or make the change? Uh, well, Mad in America, the website is supposed to be a forum for a gathering a community that wants to think about these questions, mm. and it's supposed to have voices. We have scientific uh, reports five times a week that tell about alternatives that are you know, that trauma can lead to psychosis, for example, or the benefits of nutrition. You'll see that on our site, too, scientific studies. So I want to keep Madden America going because we had like 200,000 readers last month, which is, I mean, unique leaders, which is a good thing. Um, There's a Madden Brazil that sprung up. There's a Madden for Spanish speakers. We're going to have a Madden Asia speak up uh, forum. So all this tells you is that, like, Every society that has adopted this paradigm of care gets to a point saying we want something different. I would like to write another book, but between uh, being on the road all the time and uh, running Mad America, it's just been hard to, because uh, I'm on the road about 125 days a year. Um, it speaking. gets hard. To, yeah. Yeah, yeah, speaking and all traveling. So I'm, I've been a little frustrated by uh not having the next book on my and in sight. Mm. If you were gonna, if you were gonna write another book and it wasn't about psychiatry, what would you write about? Actually, that's what the point is. I, I don't oh. want to write about psychiatry. <laughs> uh, I want to write about uh, and 
the science of raising healthy children, but not from a parental point of view. It's like from a social point of view, a societal point of view. How do you organize your society to to best nurture physically healthy, curious youth? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and. Which you, there's plenty of science around this, and it begins, of course, with prenatal care. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and then it, it begins. It's so important that first year, food environment, uh, curiosity environment, social environments. Then it goes into how you organize your schools. So, but I don't want another book that says parents you do it. It's societies need to. It's what can a society do? So you can raise physically healthy, emotionally healthy, curious children by the time you hit age 18. And here's the thing. In the same way, I got interested in psychiatry because we weren't doing so good in terms of schizophrenia outcomes. Mm. Our data regarding the health of our 18-year-olds is not good. Everything from physical health, the percentage that are depressed, the percentage that visit uh, you know, mental health counselors in college, mm. So all of this stuff tells of us, this, and even how we how well we do on comparative like uh, academic tests, it tells us that as a society we're not doing particularly well at raising healthy children. Yeah. Well, and my one of my kids um, is uh, I don't know he's um, different personality wise, but only from the point of view that he likes attention and he's very engaging. And I remember in, in your book, Anatomy, you kind of follow two children, one which is medicated, the other which isn't. And the parents of the one which isn't, the girl, they kind of accept and say she's different. She wants to be involved in the conversation. Um, and I think a big part of it is realizing that people have different personalities. And we've been at school a number of times in front of the teachers and principals, and they say, you should take him to the doctor and you should do something about this. And it's like... I don't know. That does, it just feels so wrong to us. And um, we've luckily just moved to a new place where we're right by the ocean and there's a walking path in front of our house. And it's kind of, I had this beautiful moment the other day where I kicked the kids outside and I said, I've got a five-year-old and nine and 11-year-old boys. And I said, come back in when it gets dark. Like, this is like such an old fashioned thing to say. And they were like, all right, dad. And I had to go and like literally called them in when it did get dark and say, come on in, in for dinner now. But it felt so like wholesome to be able to do that, you know. I can't think of anything better for what than that for kids. Yeah, chance to be outside, making their own decisions. Mm. See you in a little while, out in the nature. And you, by the way, it sounds like you live in a beautiful spot. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> but that no, but sounds beautiful. But yeah, listen, that's kids need to. That's a point, actually. What is what's going to happen during that time? How long was it? A couple hours? Yeah, a few hours. Yeah. Okay, they had to figure out what they wanted to do. Yeah. They made their decisions. Not only that is they were responsible for themselves. Mm. They had to like basically come back. Yeah. Right? Those are things that are teaching those kids to be comfortable outdoors, comfortable in their own minds, able to make decisions, all the things you want to do, as opposed to if you took your kids to some class, for example. Right. right. And you started ordering their time. Okay, we're gonna go here, we're gonna go here, blah blah blah. And you're you know what you're doing there? You're telling those kids, I trust you. Yeah. I trust you to do well out there. And as far as this, you have to adapt to them. No one is cut from the same cookie cutter. You know yeah. what I mean? You, you're, no one, there's kids come in all, are your kids all the same? All three are completely different. There so, you go. There, <laughs> oh, that's all you need to know. Yeah. I have two, it's completely different. Yeah. And who knows why? I don't know why. I don't know why. But another example is very quickly, we, rode our bikes the other day to the park. We got to the park and it, there were people playing soccer on a soccer pitch. And my 11 year old's like, can we play? And I was like, let's ask, can we play soccer? Yeah. Come and join in. And afterwards they were having a food and a picnic and they invited us over for food. And I was like, and then afterwards my 11 year old said, why does that feel so good? And I said, it's because we were exercising. We were meeting new people. We were playing an activity. We got welcomed into their community. This is like thousands of years old built into us as humans that we were accepted. Of course it yeah. feels good. Right. Yeah, yeah. And no pill can provide that. Got it. Well, um, I would like to say thank you so much. Um, you're an inspiration to me to talk more about this stuff and, and support in any way I can to get the word out there. So thank you for all your writing and all the work you do. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. It's great. And what you're doing is so important. So yeah. it's really good to be here. Thanks, Robert. Thank you.
There you have it, Robert Whittaker. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just can't say enough about uh, the enjoyment I have of putting that episode together and just sharing the truth. I've been talking about this a lot lately, but this isn't about, you know, trying to pull the wool over anybody uh, anybody's eyes. It's quite the opposite. It's about revealing the truth, allowing people to empower themselves and make decisions which are in their own best interest to control their destiny. That's what the whole podcast is about, right? Become a better version of yourself so hope you enjoyed that as much as i enjoyed making it for you any questions go to the contact page send me a message maybe we'll be lucky enough to do a follow-up with robert in the future and remember until next time less anxiety more life thank you for listening to the anxiety podcast for more information go to the anxietypodcast.com 